Good evening, everyone. Welcome. Welcome to the Portland Art Museum. I'm Brian Fariso, the director here. And it gives me great pleasure to welcome you or have you be part of this panel discussion, which is quite special in celebration or to expand upon the ideas in the shape of speed. Streamline automobiles and motorcycles from 1930 to 42. And I believe many of you have seen the exhibition and it features 19 objects. 17 automobiles and two motorcycles. And it's really exciting for me as the director of this museum to say that within the first month, we've had over 30,000 visitors to the show, which is a great testament, I think, to Ken and his vision. So thank you. Thank you. And that is actually, some of people, some individuals have asked, that's actually more than we had the first several weeks of Allure of the Automobile. So, very exciting, and that was in 2011. Um, before I introduce Ken and our esteemed panel, and, and it's, a, it's great to welcome Peter Mullen, Richard Adato, and David Rand with us, um, I would like to recognize our sponsors. I cannot thank them enough. This is a museum that is, that is uh, for the public good, but privately supported, and at the top of that list is our great donor, Nanny Warren, the Swaggart Warren Foundation, Bill and Helen Joe Witzel, Washington Trust Bank, The Standard, Melvin Mark Companies, Sports Car Market, Daimler Trucks North America, Mercedes-Benz of Portland, and Provenance Hotels and the Dossier are the lead sponsors. So a big round of applause for them and thank them. And what's great about Portland, as many of you know, it's a, it's a great sense in this community to support this museum. And we had over 50 donors in all to this exhibition, which is really quite remarkable. Wonderful community ownership of this show, and I'm very grateful. And part of that is the result of the leadership. We put together a, uh, a volunteer, volunteer chair board uh, called the Shape of Speed uh, Society, and that was chaired by Bob and Kathleen Ames, Kevin Blount, Keith Martin, and Jim Mark. And I am so grateful for their leadership because they really got the word out. They got people to support the show and a big thanks. And I know Kevin and Kathleen and Bob are here. So thank you very, very much. And the fun part of this now is to introduce Ken Gross, who's been a, a great partner to this museum and a, and a dear, dear advisor to me and friend. So um, as many of you may know, I've introduced Ken before, but it's always fun to to talk a little bit about his bio because it's quite remarkable. He's an historian, journalist, former director of the Peterson Automotive Museum in Los Angeles, as well as a lifelong car enthusiast. He is a 29-year Pebble Beach Concourse d'Elegance chief class judge and a member of their selection committee, which is really quite uh, incredible. Uh, Ken also judges at, judges at nearly all the major car events around the world, including Amelia Island, Boca Raton, Hilton Head, Greenwich, Hershey, and uh, concourse. Ken is widely recognized for his depth of knowledge, having received the Automotive Hall of Fame Distinguished Service Citation, the International Press Association Ken W. Purdy Award, the Motor Presses Guild Dean Bachelor Award, and the Lee Iacocca Award. As many of you may recall, he was the guest curator for us for the Allure of the Automobile in 2011. He has also curated exhibitions of fine automobiles at the Frist Center in Nashville, uh, the Indianapolis Museum of Art, the North Carolina Museum of Art, and the Museum of Fine Arts Houston, among others. Although he's owned two Ferraris, a Lamborghini, a Porsche 356, four Morgans, Ken's Garage today has three hot rod Fords from the 30s and 40s. His favorite car in the shape of speed is the Bugatti Aerolith 57, but as he said to me, he would drive any of them, including the Aeromobile. So, gives me great pleasure to welcome Ken and our panelists, and Ken, thank you again, and thank you for, for leading this discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Brian. Uh, good evening, everyone, and thank you for coming. Um, I'd like to uh, introduce our panel and tell you a little about them. Uh, to my left is Peter Mullen, who's the chairman of M Financial, but to car enthusiasts, they know him well as the chairman of the Peterson Automotive Museum and the, the man who led the team that completely redid the museum and making it one of the most exciting museums, cars or not, in the country. Uh, Peter is the... Uh, premium American collector of French cars uh, with 
probably more French cars than anybody uh, except in, in France. Uh, he's a lender to the exhibition. Uh, the Talbot Lago uh, teardrop is his car, along with the uh, Penard Lavasser X81. Peter, thank you very much for being here. Uh, on the end, we have uh, my friend Richard Adato, who is a celebrated authority on French cars, the author of From Passion to Perfection, a fabulous book, as well as books on Delahaye and Delage, and re most recently a book on Concord d'Elegance. Uh, Richard is, um, he and I are both on the Pebble Beach Selection Committee, and uh, we've judged there for many years together. And David Rand, in the center here, a new friend, uh, is the former, uh, retired now, executive director of General Motors Advanced Styling. Uh, he's an authority on streamlined cars. I, I met David uh, last summer at the um, Concours at St. John's where he gave a really impressive uh, presentation on streamlined cars, some of the illustrations of which you're seeing in the background as we are talking. Um, he's also, uh, David also wrote the essay on streamlining in the, uh, in the catalog for the exhibition and shameless plug for the museum here. If you haven't got a catalog, it's really nice and they're selling them in the, uh, in the store. So when you come back, as I hope you will, please consider a catalog. So I wanted to ask David to start our discussion tonight. And uh, interestingly, before you all arrived, uh, the, th the three of them were talking and I kept saying, God, I hope they remember because this is fabulous. So let's see what happens. Um, I wanted to ask David uh, one question, and then we'll, we'll kind of kick it off. Uh, what fostered the development of automotive streamlining beginning in the late 20s and early 30s, and why was it so important? Well, at first, I, I think we need to decide about what streamlining actually is, because there's a couple of definitions. Most people are aware of aerodynamic development today, uh, and some people equate streamlining and aerodynamics. That's the same thing. Uh, but that's not necessarily true. In the, in the late 20s, there was actually aerodynamic development happening. Uh, but, uh, people such as uh, Paul Jure uh, was uh, perhaps the first person who really did a study of taking uh, automobiles and doing uh, wind tunnel development to try and uh, quantify uh, aerodynamics. Uh, there were uh, there were uh, racing cars that actually in the uh, in the in the teens were attempting to uh, show aerodynamic development, but at that point it wasn't measured. There weren't wind tunnels that were being used. It was more an intuitive approach. Uh, at the same time, uh, by uh, even in the twenties, uh, there were numerous studies uh, that were done. Uh, 1920s automobiles didn't really exhibit uh, a, a sense of aerodynamics, except for a very small population of cars, and they certainly didn't exhibit streamlining at, at, as the type that we have in the exhibit in the cars that are from the 30s and the early 40s. It wasn't really until the 30s that some of manufacturers began to take advantage of that aerodynamic development. Uh, for example, the, uh, the Chrysler Airflow was perhaps the first car that really exhibited uh, aerodynamic development in a production car. Uh, a, lot, uh, a lot of the cars that you see, though, uh, are really more streamlined from an aesthetic standpoint. And uh, some of the designers had more of a sense of how uh, aerodynamics actually worked. But for the most part, this was really an aesthetic. Uh, at the same time, in the early 30s, you have to realize that uh, industrial design was developing, uh, product design as we know it today, and those designers were embracing streamlining like this pencil sharpener that you see here as an aesthetic. Did the pencil sharpener near to, need to be teardrop shaped or perform? No. No, but you have to realize that this was what was modern, this was what was the new. So industrial designers embraced uh, teardrop and streamlining as a way to demonstrate uh, what was fresh. Uh, well, ap apropos of that, if I can in interrupt you for just a moment, since we're talking about teardrops, yeah. uh, Peter loaned the, um, the Talbot Lago, and uh, Richard is a Figoni expert, so perhaps I could ask the two of them to talk a little bit about um, 
Figoni and the teardrop because uh, this was not a car that was scientifically designed. It really came from Figoni's sense of, of style and imagination, yes? Absolutely, Ken. Uh, the goat dough uh, was the French uh, called the teardrop tabulago, and that's just the French word for raindrop or teardrop. <clears throat> As David said, it was an aesthetic design uh, and not necessarily aerodynamic in the sense of scientifically measuring that. And, you know, everybody's got their theory about why Joseph Fagoni designed that teardrop table lago to look the way it does, which, of course, I'm a little biased, but I think it's the most gorgeous piece of rolling sculpture that's ever been designed. But when you think about how he conceived of that shape, I'm taken with the notion that if you look at a raindrop coming down out of the sky, and so what is it? It's a collection of water molecules that has to go through the atmosphere. And so what does it do? It takes on the form that slips through the air in the most dynamic shape. And so it takes on the form of a raindrop or coming down the cheek of a beautiful woman as a teardrop. And so my own theory is that Joseph Fagoni didn't need to create it out of his head. He didn't need to create it with a blank piece of paper. What he needed to do was put down his pencil and put down his paper and look around at what nature has done in terms of beautiful shapes, the Fibonacci curves of nature, and then borrow that for uh, the design of something as gorgeous as a teardrop tabulago. Now, David mentioned that don't confuse that beautiful shape with aerodynamics. Uh, so we always have fun debating these things back and forth. But I wondered about the teardrop shape as to how good the coefficient of friction was. How aerodynamic is it really in terms of slipperiness for racing, for speed? And so we took the teardrop and six other cars and ran them through wind tunnel simulations of uh, what the coefficient of friction was. And we compared it to uh, Lamborghinis, we compared it to a Dodge Viper, we compared it to uh, the new Bugatti, Chiron, uh, and, uh, and we tested it to, to measure that. And it turns out, which made me feel very pleased about, uh, you know, my theory about this anyway, T turned out the teardrop tabulago was the, it was the best coefficient of friction other than a plane that was a stealth plane uh, jet that was better. And then the teardrop was second. So I'd say, well, Fagoni didn't have a wind tunnel to prove it, but his brain proved it by looking at nature. So I don't know if David would agree, but that's my story and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> well, I, I can add a couple things to this story. Um, I talked to Claude Figoni, Joseph's son, who is like 95 and still a real brilliant man and a designer in his own right. And he said his father was inspired by the teardrop, but he was also inspired by aviation and airplanes. He would, there, there used to be like a, a landing field during World War I right by his house. And they would look at the field and they would watch the airplanes, not Claude, but his father, would watch the airplanes land and get inspired by the pontoon shape covering the wheels of the airplane. And he thought, whoa. The other thing that inspired him was, was dolphins. He loved the idea of fish going through the water. He, you know, Paris is on the water, but not really on the ocean. But he, his father took him to the south of France as a kid and he was watching dolphins swim. And the shape of fish swimming really made him think about how did that fish go so quickly through the water? And that, that it was fish, it was teardrop, it was aviation, and also the female form that kind of inspired it. Uh, he took his color palette from nature on his different cars. He looked at flowers and different things that, the, you know, the blue from the ocean, you know, the night sky. He, was inspired by the natural things around him, and that's how he made his choices. 
The, um, the cars in our exhibition, uh, they're designed by people like uh, Paul Jure, who uh, David mentioned. Uh, we don't have a Gabriel Voisin car here, but we, uh, we, we, and we don't have a Raymond Lowy car, but uh, some of these others, Hans Ledvinka, uh, John Charda, the Chrysler Trio, I, I wanted to ask, and perhaps David could start on this, uh, a lot of this was going on at the same time. These aerodynamicists were working in different countries. Did they know each other? Did they look at one another's ideas, do we think? Well, I, I don't know if they, they knew each other, but there were circumstances that were, that were kind of forcing their hand. Um, Paul Jure uh, worked for the Zeppelin Company, and uh, he, uh, he, his, he, he studied aerodynamics first before he began to apply to automobiles. Um, what he was developing prototypes in around 1922, and you have to realize this was shortly after World War I. And one of the reasons he wasn't working at Zeppelin anymore was because of uh, the uh, Treaty of Versailles, which said that the Germans could no longer build military aircraft. So he uh, it kind of forced his hand. He, he had to discover something else. At the same time, uh, there was a man, a man named Rumpler, uh, uh, Rumpel Automobiles, that was also one of the first studies in uh, using aerodynamics on automobiles. And his uh, background was uh, building aircraft as well, and it, it forced his hand it, uh, at the same time. So a number of these things were happening not by coincidence, it was because of circumstances. And uh, big cultural events uh, uh, like uh, World War I, for example. So Peter, you um, you own, and we had here on exhibition, the uh, Dubonnet Hispano Xenia, and Jean Andro, who was a famous French uh, aircraft designer, was involved with that car. Could you talk a little bit about uh, about that and about Andro and Dubonnet? Because I, I think that's a fascinating story. Well, uh, Dubonnet was the son, actually, or grandson of the creators of the French liqueur, uh, the Dubonnet. Um, liqueur and he was a pilot and a race car driver and an engineer and he conceived of, of an independent suspension system that would allow uh, uh, all four parts of the wheels of a car to be independently suspended and therefore the ride would be better and, uh, and the twisting of the axle and so on would be, uh, you know, not an issue. And he patented that system and then he retained, he, he, he used as a chassis in Hispano Suiza uh, and hired Jean Adro to help with the design of that and created uh, the Xenia, which he named after his uh, prior wife, uh, his, uh, his wife at the current time uh, took great umbrage at the name of the car. <laughs> and so he actually had to put it away and hide it. And he <laughs> told his wife that he'd gotten rid of it, he hid it uh, during the war and then right after the war, it was the first car that went through the, the tunnel. St. Cloud. Uh, that's right, St. Cloud, St. Cloud tunnel uh, after the war to show that the French were now free. And so, uh, I guess because his wife got the right in it, she forgave him for naming it the Xenia. But it is a most incredibly aerodynamic car. You look at it and you say, that's either a 1938 Dubonnet Hispano Suiza or it's a 2023 Chrysler concept car. But it's nothing in between. It is amazing, amazing shape, and uh, with uh, uh, windshields that wrap around the way uh, a, a plane, a jet pilot's windscreens wrap around, which no cars had at the time. All you know, windscreens were flat glass, except for this one. So it's a pretty amazing design. It was here at, in Portland uh, several years ago for a similar show that Ken also put on. Richard, you got lots to add on that. Uh, yeah, Andra was a, a, an amazing uh, engineer, but he, th this shows you how different people are. Andra was classically trained as an engineer from the finest schools in France. He put his energy into st aerodynamically styling this car, 
And it wasn't done th through the natural, you know, teardrop idea. It was, he was a classically trained engineer who came up with these different innovative designs. That was the big difference here. This whole show is a kind of a different thought. We have classically designed engineers like Jare and Stout who didn't like the teardrop people very much. They thought that they were just kind of seat of the pants where they were classic engineers. But the most valuable, most coveted cars in the world that are now art forms all came from the teardrop school, except the Xenia, who came from an engineer. I think that's really kind of interesting that they used new materials on that car. They used an old chassis. Nobody really cared about the chassis that much. They just wanted to see streamlined styling, something that would go fast. I wanted to comment on why Europeans were so into streamlined styling. The difference between Europe and America is, America has plenty of gasoline cheap, but in like France, there are not, there's, no, there's no oil wells in France and Italy, and fuel is super expensive. And taxation was punitive on high horsepower. So what they were doing is trying to get the most fuel efficient, small motored, you know, <coughs> thoughtfully designed cars that would go down the road, not cost too much. And the French cars were one liter, two liter, where the big American cars were three liter, four liter, five liter, and bigger. And the, the compelling urge in France and in Italy, Germany, was to get, get you down the road fast and efficiently. And that's part of being modern. It was the, the, the search for speed, but at a, at a reasonable cost. Americans didn't care, gas was cheap. But in Europe, they totally cared. We have to understand what the setting was, Ken. The, there was an economic chaos in Europe. There was a division, be, the, the gap between rich and poor was outrageous. People were paying, like Peter's Delahaye, or the red Delahaye that was here, I think, before, and the current Delahaye that you're seeing out there, or that Bugatti, that little Delahaye cost $8,000 brand new when you could buy a Citroen for $500. And so whoever was driving that car around, people instantly knew they were a wealthy person. And there was concourse shows and everything else that was, that was taking place there. But, you know, German reparations after World War I, you know, terrible labor strikes. And there was these, the most beautiful cars came out of, the, out of Europe because it was the streamlined decade. People... The best designers on the best chassis made the coolest things. I, I, I just wanted to point out this drawing right now. This is a Jure patent drawing. And if you look at it, uh, he actually did embrace teardrop. Uh, because, well, can we go back? Is that possible? I don't think so. No. Okay. <laughs> All right. But if, if you... If we you, can only go... So forward. if you could remember those drawings... If you were, that, that there was teardrop shapes to the uppers. And so, t oh, thank, oh, you, yeah. thank you, thank you. Yeah, uh, the, 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 the plan view drawings, which are the, uh, the lower drawing in each section, if you notice, it's, uh, it's looking down on the car. If you notice the upper, they're all almost perfectly teardrop. So at that point, it, whether it was true or not, it, the teardrop was being embraced as the theoretically perfect shape for aerodynamics. And Jarre was, was using this. You have to remember that when Jarre worked for Zeppelin, he was designing uh, blimps that were uh, generated into the teardrop shape. So, uh, for example, the Hindenburg wouldn't look like what it did unless Jarre was there. So this is the science that he used to develop automobiles. And you have to also think, in 1922, can we go to the next one? Is that possible? Yeah, 1923. Um, these cars are, frankly, somewhat awkward looking because of the proportions of chassis at the time. But they are absolutely remarkable if you consider that there are no separate fenders. It's a fully integrated shape. The headlights are sunken into the body. The radiator uh, is sunken into the body. And if you want to really understand what, it's not mine, <laughs> what, 1923, can we go back one, 
the, the last car in the line is what 1923 actually looked like. So you have to understand how remarkably advanced these cars were at the time. I'd love to add, uh, Ken, just a, a thought about this teardrop shape. Uh, you know, cars are great, but stories uh, are great, maybe better sometimes. But uh, David, before he became uh, the head of General Motors uh, Advanced Design, uh, was a graduate of Art Center uh, Transportation School College of Design in Pasadena. And he shared with me that one of his teachers uh, there was a gentleman by the name of Struther McMinn, who's kind of famous in the car world, the design world, and uh, really headed the, the design school of transportation at Art Center for, I think, 50 years uh, before he retired. And what he said about the teardrop Tabalago, uh, the, the one upstairs, uh, was something that I thought kind of says it all. What he said was the Talbo Godot coupe represents what may be the finest example of assembled form ever applied to the automobile. So that was a heck of a statement yeah. and it probably influenced David's view along the way. Well, it, we uh, were talking, uh, Ken and I were talking, we had walked the show and uh, frankly, some of the, the volumes of the car, like the, uh, uh, the Chrysler... Um, the Thunderbolt. The Thunderbolt, is, um, is on one hand very modern. It's a full envelope form, integrated fenders, but it's, it's quite heavy proportionally, and it's a little awkward. However, when you uh, look at uh, like uh, the Talbo, where it, you know, the, you, it has separate fender forms, obviously, but each of the forms are so beautifully rendered. The, the volumes, the sections, I mean, a, a great example. Uh, it's almost like you could tap on the fender, on the front fender, and it would ring like a bell because of the tautness of the, the surfaces. So uh, we were talking before that, uh, you know, even if these cars ultimately were not aerodynamic as we understand it today, they're so beautifully expressive of what they do and of the form. They, you know, they, these were very exciting cars that celebrated that they were dynamic objects. Um, and for that reason, you know, that, that's why I think we all love these cars. You know, one reason why these cars are so popular right now, and they were popular right then, was there was something new and fresh. People had come off a depression. People had come off some really rough economic times, and they were inspired by these fresh new shapes. And this is what kind of gave people hope. They looked at these kind of cars, even though they were driven by people of, of great wealth, they were going, wow, this looks so different. It gave them an optimistic look for the future. And I think that this is an important part of the Streamline movement, that it was, it was full of optimism, it was yes. full of hope in a time when the country, like we had the stock market crash in 1929, and they're, they're selling cars like the Red Delahaye sold for $36,000. You could buy 30 Fords for that much money, but somebody paid $30,000 or $36,000 for a couple of these cars. It was about timing, but it was about hope, it was about optimism, it was about looking for something new and different, and all these cars brought that forward. Peter, uh, unless, unless you, you all think that that uh, teardrop Talbo is just a Paris gown on wheels, there's a fabulous story about that car with uh, Freddie McAvoy driving, if you'd like to tell us yeah. that, it's just terrific. Well, one of the early owners of this teardrop here was a, was a gentleman by the name of Freddie McAvoy, who was the Olympic bobsled champion in 1936. And he was also a race car driver. And uh, in fact, the teardrops ran, three of them ran at Le Mans, so they were designed to race as well as to look good. Uh, anyway, he owned one, and he was kind of a playboy, uh, man about town, really handsome guy, uh, and uh, you know, loved everything about cars, women, lifestyle fast. Anyway, the, the great, it's a story, but it's real, uh, was that he was sitting with Barbara Hutton 
and a bar one night, and she was the Woolworth heiress, uh, and so extraordinarily wealthy. And they were talking about cars, and he said, I, I think that I could drive my teardrop Tabalago from Paris to Nice in under 10 hours. And she said, no way could anybody drive a car over the Alps, all through the tiny little villages and the switchbacks uh, from Paris to Nice. It can't happen. No one could do that in 10 hours or less. And he bet her $10,000. This was in the early 40s. That was real money at the time. Now, if he'd lost, I have no idea how he was gonna come up with $10,000, but uh, that was the bet he took. And so he did it uh, overnight, uh, 565 miles through the mountain ranges of the Alps and got to Nice in nine hours and 45 minutes and collected the $10,000. And so, to me, it's stories like that that make these cars come alive. Because cars are beautiful, but stories surrounding cars are what causes it to stick in your brain and then you never forget that anecdote. So. Some of these cars, uh, in particular, the, the Delahaye and the Talbot Lago, uh, are really like bespoke. Would you hold the microphone to your Certainly. Lady? Yep, thank you. Was that you, Doug, telling me? God bless. Um, I, um, uh, I wanted to point out that these are like bespoke automobiles, the way they would be bespoke suits or gowns. And maybe Richard could tell us kind of quickly how the process worked from sketches to, uh, to the cars being built. Like the Talbot Lago upstairs was sold probably by Freddie McAvoy or Luigi Canetti. They were, most of these cars were sold to people of great wealth. The process would be, um, the, usually it was the man, sometimes it was the woman, this woman named Beatrice Cartwright, who was the heiress to Standard Oil of New Jersey, would find a guy like, and go out with Freddie McAvoy for a while, and then he would convince her to buy a car. She would go down to Fagoni, they would go to the George Song Hotel, drink champagne, and think about what it was gonna look like and what color it would be. They would pick out the, you know, the, there's a couple of styles of Talbot Lago teardrops, and you know, Freddie wanted her to buy that particular car because it was a very expensive car and he got paid well to do it. And he was kind of dating her. So the, you know, they would sit there, Fagoni would be there, they'd sit around and drink, drink wine for like three or four hours and figure out the general idea. And then from there, they would go to Chanel or Chaparelli and they'd decide what color the car would really be and what the interior would be and what her dress would look like. And they would build this car in 2,200 hours, which is like four or five months. Four guys working on it, it would be done. And usually it would be planned around parties and going out. You know, a specific thing, a social event, where you want to make a big splash, open the door, and there you are. That would be typical of buying a car at Fagoni or some of the other major coach builders. It was kind of crazy. But then it came to be the next season. Sometimes they had to repaint the car, go back to the dressmaker, go back to Chanel and say, oh, I need a different gown now. Oh, okay. And they would do the whole thing over a couple of seasons, and then that was done, and they'd buy a new car. I, I have to say, as, as somebody who's made their living through designing cars, I'm really jealous of that process. <laughs> you know, the very phrase, Concord d'Elegance, which we throw around, there's one coming up at Pebble Beach here this uh, next month. Uh, but the Concorde d'Elegance originally, which was a French concept, was, was a show of elegance and it had to do with the car, sure, but it was really about the woman and her shoes and her purse and her luggage and the dog that she had on uh, reins and her hat and the car and the fact that the car might have been painted to match her favorite dress as opposed to the other way around. And so it was a package presentation, and the winner of a Concorde d'Elegance was the, was the entire package, with I would say maybe the core of it being the woman and the car, 
And that's what, the, that, that's what got the trophy, the award. We've lost a little bit of that in the sense that Concord Delegants now are mostly about the cars. But I, I kind of intrigued with the idea that we ought to bring it back a little bit to the original concept of Conqueror Delegates. Yeah, Peter, it was called the ensemble. Everything was about the woman presenting herself to the judges, and the judges would be both men and women. And there would be a reviewing stand, you'd drive around, you'd get out of the car, the driver, which is often a chauffeur and not the husband, would get out. Take the, open the woman's store, they bow to the judges, get back in the car and drive back. And it was all about presentation. The, the other the reason why we, the Concord was so popular with everybody is most regular people couldn't go to Fashion Week in Paris or the car, you know, it just wasn't available to them. So when they wanted to see what the latest fashion was, they would go to the Concord as spectators and see what women were wearing and people would knock off those dresses if they could. So some of the cars in, the, um, in this exhibition were not sales successes. I mean, they're interesting, but they, uh, in a couple of cases, only one was built and one was sold. The Chrysler Airflow probably gets a bad rap a little bit as a car that, uh, that was not as successful as Chrysler wanted. We have a, a lovely example here. David and I were looking at it the other day and he saw a beauty in it that uh, pointed out to me and maybe you talk a little about the airflow designed by engineers but uh, a remarkable car for its time. It, it, obviously, it, it is controversial. It's still controversial today. Some people love it and some people um, don't. But... Um, we, we were talking about the fact that it's, uh, the design is what is blamed for the, the failure of the vehicle. And that ultimately may not be perfectly true, given the fact that when the car was being built, it was an all new type of structure for Chrysler. They hadn't built a car like that before, so there were delays of getting it to the customer. And there were enormous quality problems that uh, also were at the beginning of the car, uh, at the production of the car. So. Um, it is, uh, I, I argue that there were a number of cars that came afterwards, like a Peugeot and a Volvo that came a year later that look remarkably like it, and the Peugeot uh, was successful. So I'm, I'm not totally buying the argument that it was uh, just the design that was the cause of the failure for the vehicle. I'd like to chime in that Paul Jarre designed the Peugeot, and he had influence on the Chrysler airflow. Uh, Chrysler denied that, that they took his patents, but he sued them because he opened an American office so he could sue them, and he collected a little bit of money for it. It's disputed whether he ever got the money, and then World War II happened, and all bets were off. Right, and I, I think he, he sued Peugeot as well. He did, but they paid him, and the difference between the Peugeot and the Chrysler's, one car cost $800, one cost $3,200. So the Peugeot was much more financially accepted, and the French people were more interested in something new and different that was affordable. To them, the Chrysler was a luxury car. So one of the cars in the exhibition that uh is perhaps the most unusual, I think, and, and isn't known much by enthusiasts, is the Tatra. And I would love to have our panel talk about the Tatra a little, because it, technically it's brilliant, and, uh, and on and on. Um, the, the Tatra um, is actually uh, the, I believe it's the only production car that, um, used the Jure patents and paid for him for it as well. Um, it is um, uh, a remarkable car in the sense that uh, it's almost a, a cartoon, a caricature of what a streamlined car would be in the early 30s. It is, it is um, uh, uh, if, if you don't know, uh, you should look, but it is a rear engine air-cooled V8. Uh, its engineering is remarkable. It actually is not unlike uh, the development of the Volkswagen Bug at the same time because uh, the, uh, the engineer of, of Ferdinand and Porsche knew the engineer Hans Ludwinka, uh, who developed this car. Um, 
it, uh, it is it Czechoslovakia, and you know, most people don't know what a Tatra is. Most people didn't know that Czechoslovakia actually produced cars. It's the second oldest uh, automotive mag manufacturer in the world. Um, and it was daring, it was advanced, and it's, to me it's another vehicle that really expresses what it does um, by its visual vocabulary. It looks like it goes through the wind. And again, you have to remember, this is 1934. It's a remarkable car. I think, Ken, there's an interesting story about the Tatra. So, as David just mentioned, they're made in Czechoslovakia. I believe it's the case that that was the only car that continued to be manufactured as a car during World War II, because all the rest of the car manufacturers were turned into munitions factories, or they made trucks, or they made cannons, or whatever they, they made. Uh, the Germans, who had taken over Czechoslovakia, had them continue to make cars. In fact, in our own collection, the only car that's not a French car is a Tatra, because of the extraordinary designs, which just really speak to my heart. But, but uh, because the uh, Czechs were so upset by being taken over by Germany, and then the reason that Germany allowed the Tatras to continue to be made during the war, because all the German generals and the high muckety-muck Germans wanted to be driven around in a Tatra uh, in the back, uh, you know, shouting Heil Hitler, whatever, and, uh, and, and so that was their way to, to show their, their might and strength. And so uh, the story is that the engineers at Tatra decided, because it's a rear engine car, and so the, the weight distribution is very important on a car if it's going to be driven fast, which is if the weight is dispersed incorrectly, it makes them very volatile in turns and corners uh, where they'll spin around or roll over. And so the Czech engineers said, well, you know, we can only be passive aggressive here. So the way we'll do that is that we'll change the weight uh, and the weight distribution on the Tatras because they're going to be driven by all the German uh, the, uh, high military guys. So the anecdotal story, which I, I doubt is exactly true, but it's an interesting story anyway, is that more German generals were, ki were, were killed in Tatras than were ever killed during the war. And so the Czechs finally got back at them. <laughs> it was the Allies' secret weapon. <laughs> Uh, Peter, while you're talking for a moment, uh, French cars are, are really a passion for you, and perhaps uh, it may be obvious to some, but I'd, I'd love to hear some of your thoughts about French cars and why you like them so much. Well, I have been a car guy. Uh, I've had a car bug since I was a kid. My dad was a chemical engineer, worked for Mobile Oil, and so he used to take us to car-related events of course, he would say, uh, you know, P Peter, look at this Mobile One oil and look at the cylinder walls and you see there's no wear on these cylinder walls after 10,000 hours and so on. And I would look at him and say, Dad, you know, and then he would say, and the, and the engineering, look at this engine inside. And, and so he would spend all his time talking about the engineering aspect and he was the head of the lab at Mobile and so his job was to come up with synthetic oils and so on. And of course, I would be there looking at the cars, looking at the styling, looking at the speed, looking at the beauty, and I would say, God, Dad, get a life for Christ's sake. <laughs> so he taught me about how cars worked. I taught him about how cars looked. And so I was always a car guy. Uh, uh, but not French cars. And then like 35, 38 years ago, Ken, uh, uh, a gentleman called me and said, could I borrow the front of your house to uh, have a car calendar made and we'd use your house as the backdrop for a, a car shoot? And I said, sure. And I came home a little early and the car was still there and it was in front of our home and they were still shooting late afternoon shots to get the sunlight just right on it. And I looked at the car and I my mouth dropped and I said, I've never seen anything so gorgeous in my entire life. What is it? 
and they said, well, this is a Delahaye. And I had no idea what that meant. I never heard of the word Delahaye. I didn't know how to say it, couldn't spell it, didn't know where it came from. I said, tell me more, tell me more. And they, oh, well, that's a French car. It was a post-war car. It was uh, a 135 MS. And uh, I thought, holy cow. I mean, this just gives me a whole different sense of cars. And the pre-war and just post-war French cars were the absolute apex in, I think, the history of the automobile in terms of engineering, speed, and beauty. Nothing ever came close to those pre-war and just post-war French cars. So I was totally hooked, and that led to the restoration of Etabo Lago, and then it went, you know, from there, one of these things where an interest becomes a commitment, a commitment becomes a passion, uh, a passion becomes a sickness, and ultimately, <laughs> ultimately it's terminal, but I'm not quite at terminal yet, but I'm through most of the rest of them. So from that point on, I never had eyes for anything but French cars, and so our entire collection, with the exception of the Tatra, are French cars. Uh, I will add to that that uh, Peter's Museum is in Oxnard, California. It's an hour and a half on a good day north of Los Angeles, and an absolute must if you've never been there. The uh, decor resembles the Paris Salon in the 1920s and 30s. The cars are breathtaking, and there's art as well, because uh, the Bugatti family, maybe we could segue into talking about artists that created automobiles like the, like the Bugattis. The Bugatti family may be the singular most extraordinary example of a generations of artists or artisans, starting with Carlo Bugatti, who designed furniture, and uh, uh, painted beautiful uh, oil paintings. He decided late in life, Carlo, that he actually would try his hand at silversmithing. And so somebody told him, look, Carlo, you know, you're a genius at furniture. You're a great painter. You've got great style and vision. But I mean, silversmithing, you know, it takes you 20 years just to be able to do anything in silver. So don't even waste your time. You're too old to start. And he heard that, thought about it, rejected it. And within a year and a half, he was creating silver bowls that were running, winning all of the, all of the competitions. So that was the grandfather. Uh, his sons were Ettore Bugatti, uh, who uh, was the genius designer of the Bugatti automobile. Uh, another son of his was Rembrandt Bugatti, who was probably known as the greatest uh, bronze animal sculptor of all time. Uh, Etor's son, Jean Bugatti, was the one who designed the Atlantique that we've been seeing here. Uh, the daughter, Caroline Bugatti, is, is a friend of ours and alive and well today, and she designs luggage. And so it's like four generations of genius. And if you look at any other family and say, show me four generations of artistic and artisanal genius, you can't find it. Because Merle and I, my wife who's back here, she and I have looked to see what analogies we could find in the history uh, of generations that continued to show that kind of excellence. There's only one that came close, which was uh, a, a, a family of psychiatrists who f the father and then the son were psychiatrists. It turns out ultimately that they were both crazy and so uh, what, whatever gene they were passing on uh, didn't, qu didn't quite uh, turn out to result in a great outcome. But uh, so it was a remarkable, remarkable family and people think Bugatti, uh, I mean that must be an Italian car Bugattis were, I mean, of course, the name Bugatti is Italian, and they came originally from Italy, but the Bugattis are all French cars until the modern Bugatti, which is owned by Volkswagen. Uh, David, I wanted to ask you, as an advanced design uh, director at General Motors, did you all ever look at some of these 30s-era cars, with a, not with a notion to bring them back, per se, but just to learn something from them? Is that, was that part of the process at all? 
It, it wasn't from the standpoint of institutionalizing it uh, to have designers look at it, but um, you know, I, I would argue that the uh, the effect of me personally as you know uh, compositions of line and form and uh, and how to do it. Um, I would sometimes uh, point out older cars to my designers and say, "Take a look at this. You know, take a look at this part." But um, I think it was really more personal than anything else. Mm. Uh, uh, Richard, I wanted to, uh, to. Richard has done uh, what I would have to call archaeological work to find records, photographs, drawings, renderings, um, and has amassed a wonderful collection. Uh, maybe you could share a little of of how you've done this, how you've found these uh, drawings. Well, I, yeah, I found most of my drawings in Paris in little shops and in small auctions where people weren't, you know, it wasn't hip, I guess, or desirable to buy original drawings of French cars in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. People were not collecting these things. But I went through France and I bought as many of these as I could find. And to my amazement, uh, I, I found that Fagoni, uh, Georges Paulin, a lot, of the, a lot of these really great designers were designing for General Motors. And, you know, when I talked to General Motors, they went ridiculous. But actually, I have the drawings and the work orders from General Motors to Fagoni, and they said, we'd like a new Buick, and we want it to be sort of French style. And so I have French style Buicks. I've got, you know, Chrysler, I have French Chryslers, I've got French Buicks. I even found uh, one, you know, French company that penned the, the XK120 Jaguar. And you'd go, no, 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 that was done in England. But I actually have the physical drawings that say, oops, wait a minute. Uh, these French designers were working on Jaguars post-war. And it's kind of interesting to see that the French influence on major manufacturers like General Motors and Chrysler were started from the beginning. And they actually built a couple of these cars. I don't know where they are. No one has ever seen them. But they were actually built because there's. I found the sales records for them. I, you know, I dig deep and I go long to try to find these little places, and go to these little pl shops, network with guys or people who are aging out. You know, in France, don't have anybody to give these to, or no one's really interested. But I'm really passionate about it, so they they sell them or give them to me. You mentioned Georges Poulin, who I think is um, obviously one of the best designers of the period, an interesting and tragic story, and maybe you would tell us a little about him and what he did. Uh, George Poulin was a kind of an untrained person who, who learned how to be a car designer. He was working as a dentist and knew detailed work, but he designed some of the most gorgeous cars in the world. He did a Bentley called the Embercos Bentley, which today looks like a brand new prototype. It may come up. Um, it's It'll come just, up in a moment, too. Oh, it's, yeah, it's going to come up. You know, he was a guy that would take uh, Peugeots and, and streamline them, and people were excited to see it. That he made, you know, Rolls Royces, he made Bentleys. Bentley hired him, and had World War II not come along, he would have produced some of the finest Bentleys and Rolls Royces ever built. Unfortunately, he was killed. He was part of a resistance movement. The British government and the U.S. Navy were paying a series of car designers to network and get U.S. flyers out of France. So it was really tragic. Uh, George Plamont and Kellner were discovered, and they were shot and killed. And, and we lost some of our best you know, designers. Wow. We, are, we may be close to our stop time, and I'm wondering if we have some questions out here anyone would like to ask. I know we've, we've kind of wandered the subject, and we could probably spend hours talking details, but well, taking advantage of these knowledgeable folk here, anyone have any questions that they'd like to ask? Well, And, and what's happening in auto design uh, in, in France? Someone like to jump on that one? <laughs> um, I, I can talk from the uh, uh, personal viewpoint, so take it with a grain of salt. Uh, when I was growing up um, in the 60s, uh, French cars were basically weird. 
Uh, I, and I didn't know at that time the history of French cars, um, but in the 60s, you know, Citroën DSs, which I have uh, grown to love as a design statement, were very strange. And uh, uh, Renault's, there was something about French design that was strange. And um, I think that continued for a number of decades. I'd argue now that unfortunately, there was a period when you could tell a German car from a French car from an English car. It's all become somewhat more homogenized. And part of the reason is that uh, designers are very international at this point. Each studio you go to, you will find a mixture of nationalities. And uh, I believe this tends to water down uh, a, a more nationalistic approach. So in some ways, French design for me is more acceptable uh, it's uh, more international, and certainly it has less character than it did. But Peter's Museum uh, did an exhibition of Citroën, and we will also have a Citroën class this year at Pebble Beach, and I know you're quite fascinated with Citroëns, and perhaps you could tell us why. Well, for years, Ken, uh, and I was focused on collecting French cars, and I just kept walking by Citroëns, and they didn't really turn me on. They were, as David said, you know, I thought they were kind of weird. Uh, but when I realized that Citroën was uh, going to celebrate their 100th anniversary of continuous car production, I thought, you know, Peter, it's a French car. You ought to pay more attention to it. So. I kind of got intrigued. I had seen a Citroen DS back when I was in high school. A friend of mine's father showed up and picked him up in one. I thought, that's the weirdest car I've ever seen. And then he climbed in, and the car went up and down, and then it took off. And it was like a spaceship. But I studied them and then learned the early history of Andre Citroen and what a marketing genius he was and uh, looked back all the way to 1919 uh, when the first Citroen was designed and, uh, and followed the, the, the route of Citroen you know, through the uh, 1925 Paris exhibition that created the Art Deco movement. And, uh, and those cars, the five CVs and the sevens, and then into the Traction Avance, before the war, and then right after the war, uh, in the uh, uh, 50s, when uh, they, France was trying to recover from being broke, and they ultimately then had a, you know, a French exhibition in Paris, and Citroën showed up late. Uh, their stand was empty through about 11 o'clock, in the day of the show and everybody said, yeah, well, that's typical, you know, Citroen blew it, they don't even have a car to show. And all of a sudden the rear doors opened and six uh, DSs came in and were parked on this elevated stand in the middle of the Paris auto exhibition. And people's mouths dropped. They said, we've never seen anything like that. At the end of the first day, 8,000 orders were taken for the new Citroen which probably is the record of first car sales of all time. It took them three years, I think, to deliver the 8,000 orders. And so from there, uh, the ID and then the DS, and it kept progressing with these incredible engineering designs and suspension and power steering and all, all kinds of unbelievable engineering. And then ultimately, uh, they came out with, they acquired, in effect, uh, Maserati, and then they brought out the SM that David and I were just talking about because both he and I love that wild SM shape, but that's a Maserati, six-cylinder Maserati engine in it. And so they continued, that was in the 60s and then 70s, and they continued to make Citroens but they quit shipping them to the United States in 1973, and so they've never sent Citroens again since 1973, so nobody in the U.S. can even remember what a Citroen looks like. Uh, and the, the new ones, actually, the C6s and so on, are quite good-looking cars uh, and fast. And anyway, they've just announced this past couple of months that they're now going to re-enter the United States 
but so that's the good news. The bad news is I've looked at the Citroen that they're going to reintroduce to the United States, but they're essentially owned by Peugeot now. Uh, but uh, you won't want, you won't wrote, write home about it. Uh, I'm afraid. <laughs> but uh, in any case, uh, that that was an era, and Andre Citroen was an absolute marketing genius, and. Uh, uh, he, uh, when Josephine Baker was the hottest thing in Paris, uh, and everybody, uh, regardless if you were a, if you were a, a heart beating male, you thought Josephine Baker was it, and so he said, "Aha!" He called up Josephine Baker and said, "Here, I'd like to give you a Citroen to drive around Paris." And so every time there was a picture shown of Josephine Baker, she's inside a Citroen or standing by one, and so he had that incredible nose for great marketing. Would, another question, anyone? Hi, uh, thanks, thanks for giving this discussion. I was wondering if uh, someone on the panel could actually um, uh, discuss the Vosan mark uh, a little bit, because uh, this show is called Shape of Style, and it seems like the Vosan mark, they're styling was almost a counter to what's on display at the show here in the Portland Art Museum. And um, I think, uh, well, I was at Mr. Mullen's museum to see the Vosan show that he put on. And it, the, the vehicles are quite extraordinary, but they, they're also quite different. So I was wondering if, if someone could speak to that. I think that's Thank a you. Peter question about Vosan. I could, and, uh, and, and Richard could definitely weigh in, but uh, Gabriel Wazan was actually, early on in his life, was an airplane uh, designer and constructor. And uh, although the people in Kitty Hawk aren't favorites of this story, the truth is uh, that probably uh, Wazan uh, was actually the father of flight in the sense that he designed a plane that took off and circled and landed in the same place, uh, which the Wright brothers never did uh, uh, in the same time frame that Gabriel Vazan did. So one might argue that he actually was the father of flight. Jay Leno said that one time on his show because he had he was interviewing uh, us to look at Boisans. So he mentioned that on his show, and the feedback he got was unbelievably <laughs> negative. People say, Jay, you know, what are you talking about? That you're, tell you're telling me that the Wright brothers weren't the founders of the aircraft, and who is this clown Mullen there? Don't ever put him back on your show. And by the way, you ought to be ashamed of yourself, Jay. Uh, I'm not even sure I'm going to watch you anymore. This is heresy. And I saw that, and I called out Jay and said, geez, Jay, I mean, I had no idea this was pushback was going to be. He said, Peter, forget it. He said, as long as they're calling and writing, it doesn't make any difference. <laughs> what they said. So, but uh, uh, Voisin uh, built 10,000 planes <coughs> for World War I. Uh, the French used his planes. The English used his planes, the Americans used his planes. Uh, so he was a prolific airplane uh, designer and builder. And in 1919, the end of World War I, uh, he decided that uh, he wasn't gonna build planes anymore. And so he, he built cars. And of course, he was hugely influenced by airplane design. So when we look at a Vauzon and say, that's not the kind of styling I would have thought of a great French stylist, it's because it's airplane technology all the way through. And so, uh, it, you know, that's a baby that you have to learn to love. Uh, but once you get hooked on Boisans, I mean, they are an amazing, amazing vehicle. And his number one designer, uh, Boisan, uh, when they shut down the Boisan factory at the end of, uh, uh, of uh, just before World War II broke out, uh, he sent his number one designer over to Citroen, and that's who designed the great Citroens. After that was a Voisin designer. So he had a huge influence on design 
uh, Corbusier and he were pals. Uh, he put up the money for Corbusier to redesign the interior of Paris. Corbusier's greatest buildings had a big turn, uh, a, 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 a turnaround in the middle of the buildings or the homes. And you say, where did you get that idea and where's that turn? And he said, Gabriel Voisin said that the, uh, the, that the paving out in front of this building had to be uh, exactly the dimensions that a Voisin could turn the entire thing without <laughs> twisting the wheel. And so it, it, he was an amazing guy. He lived to the his 90s. He, uh, he married very late in life to uh, a dancer in France. Uh, and as the story goes, uh, probably can't get away with saying this these days, but as the story goes, uh, he married the dancer and of course the bride's family had to make a gift to the husband, which was the, the in the era, that's what the, the, the bride's parents did. And they didn't have any money, so they presented him with his wife's younger sister. And so the two of them actually lived together in Paris for, or three of them lived together in Paris until he died, and I think at age 94. <laughs> Lending new meaning to the word dowry, <laughs> I think. Yeah, to your point, sir, uh, I gave a presentation the other day for the art and conversation group, and I wasn't sure anyone would do this, but at the end, someone asked the question, if, was there a car that you would have liked to have had, but you didn't? And I had the slide to show, and it was a Voisin Aerosport. So they, are, they really are fabulous cars. When World War I ended, they had thousands of these airplanes, and the secondary market for an airplane was next to nothing. He had this huge factory and all these trained employees, so he just jumped right into the car business. And he, people liked his cars. They were reasonably priced for his low-priced models, and his high-priced models were just like everybody else's high-priced models. They were really expensive, but he prospered for a while until the market fell out because of the economy. Could you elaborate at all on the advent of serious wind tunnel testing? Uh, did it occur in the 30s with Auto Union, Mercedes, and some of the other race cars, or did that come much later? It, I don't know, I'll speak really briefly. It, it started, wind tunnels started really early in the, the late 20s, and as it went into the 30s, people started using the wind tunnel pretty exclusively. I think you should speak more to it. Um, it's a bit of a trick question. It, it, today, it's standard practice to use a wind tunnel to develop a vehicle. It, you, have to, you have to get a drag coefficient, I think, to, to go through a program. Um, in my, um, when I, I started with General Motors in the, in the late 70s, and uh, at that point, they were not wind tunneling every vehicle. And when um, General Motors built their own wind tunnel on the grounds of the uh, tech center where the development was, um, they would slowly begin to test more cars but it went from a point of uh, when you would get the results, it's like you'd laugh them off. It's like, oh, it's too bad it didn't do so well. There were other considerations that were more important. It, 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 it took a while from that point in time for um, aerodynamic testing to be considered as, an, as important as it is today. And, and part of the reason that aerodynamics was so important, is, it's kind of a simple equation. If your car has good numbers, um, that means you can probably get away with a slightly heavier car than you could otherwise. If it has good numbers, you can probably get away with a less powerful engine than you could otherwise. So the, the, the balancing of uh, different requirements uh, uh, is why I think you know, the, the, everybody tests today because of uh, fuel economy standards being so difficult, uh, it, is, it is part of the development process that, uh, that, is, that is integral in today's automobiles. 
But it also, it, 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 and I tell this story as a kind of a reflection about how things have changed over the last 30 years. I'd like to thank uh, Peter and David and Richard very much and thank you all for your attention tonight. We've, uh, we appreciate having been here. <laughs>